The video was prepared especially for the Akakosian channel. Greetings, friends. When working with digital circuits, you have probably encountered an effect, known as contact bounce. It manifests as erroneous key presses, or incorrect encoder activations. In this video, I want to briefly explain what it is, and how to deal with it using purely hardware methods. So, contact bounce. Let's take a button. We'll connect one of its leads to the power supply through a resistor, and the other lead to ground. Let's look at the signal from the button on an oscilloscope. We expect to see something like this, high voltage, once, and it becomes low, and then, once, and it becomes high. In reality, the button, which consists of two mechanical surfaces, forms multiple switches upon contact, due to the imperfections of the contact surfaces, and the force of elasticity. This will lead to the following signal at the output. Due to such noise, problems arise with processing button presses and encoder rotations, because the system sees each of these pulses as a separate press. Now let's look at methods to combat this issue. A fairly common method to eliminate the bounce is by connecting a capacitor in parallel with the button. And here we need to conduct an experiment. Let's take two microchips, the K155LN1, which has six NOT gates in TTL implementation, and the K561LN1, which also has six NOT gates, but made using CMOS technology. Connect a 10 kilo ohm variable resistor to the input of the microchip, and start gradually changing the voltage at the input of the microchip. We'll use an oscilloscope to observe what happens at the input and output. Let's start with the TTL inverter. It is evident that at low voltage, the microchip operates in linear mode. Gradual change in the input voltage leads to a gradual change in the output voltage, and only after a certain threshold is the level fixed. Now for the CMOS inverter. When the threshold level is reached, the output level switches. No gradual change is observed. In fact, TTL and CMOS inverters have the following transfer characteristics. Besides the saturation and cutoff regions, there is also an amplification region with high steepness. When logic chips are in this region, they consume maximum power and can simply overheat and burn out. To test the functionality of such simple circuits, it's convenient to use breadboards. Now let's connect a button with a capacitor to these microchips. What happens? At the moment the button is pressed, the charged capacitor essentially connects to the ground and discharges with a large current. When the button is released, the capacitor will charge through the pull-up resistor, thereby smoothing the signal edge from the button. What happens at the output of the microchips? For TTL microchips, the gradual change on the edge will turn into a gradual decline. With a gradual change in level, the microchip will amplify power supply noise, which can lead to additional bounce. That wasn't present on the button, due to crossing the threshold level. For CMOS microchips, the gradual change on the edge turned into a single clear edge. From this, the following considerations arise. Adding a capacitor in parallel with the button will help partially eliminate contact bounce when using buffer CMOS microchips and an RC circuit. However, to limit the discharge current, it should still be connected as follows. Through the second resistor, the capacitor will charge and discharge smoothly. At the output, we will get a good digital signal. However, firstly, this is unacceptable for TTL microchips. Secondly, the smooth rise and fall still increase the load on the CMOS element, as the transistors operate in linear mode for some time, and therefore may simply burn out. In general, power supply noise can lead to jitter if it overlaps with the rise or fall. And here we come to the Schmidt trigger. Let's also apply the signal from the potentiometer to the buffer element, the Schmidt trigger, which has feedback resulting in a wide hysteresis loop of 800 millivolts. That is, when the voltage drops to the level of 0.9 volts, the one at the output will become zero. And when the level rises back, the switching will only occur when it reaches the level of 1.7. And the signal with bounce passing through this element takes on the following form. It's important to remember not to use capacitors with large capacitance, otherwise you risk welding the button contacts, and then wondering why nothing works. Capacitors of 0.1 microfarad are sufficient. The Schmidt trigger is available in various form factors. For example, the K155TL2 chip, or the CMOS version CD40106, contains six such elements, but now single Schmidt triggers are also produced in SOT23 packages such as the 74HC1G14. Thanks to these remarkable elements, in addition to debouncing contacts, 
You can also restore the rising and falling edges of noisy digital signals. Overall, it's an extremely useful thing. I recommend everyone to get acquainted with it. However, besides Schmidt triggers, the electronics industry also produces specialized chips for debouncing. For example, MC144900 or Mac 68, 16, 17, and 18. Buttons are connected to them, and the signal lines are taken from the outputs, without any bounce. A digital delay is implemented inside, and if, for instance, the MC144900 chip requires an additional capacitor, the Mac 6816 chips do not require any additional components. However, in addition to the bounce of tactile buttons, there is also bounce in switches. To suppress bounce in such cases, an RS flip-flop circuit is classically used. The flip-flop switches on the first rising and falling edge, ignoring all other noise. You can also use a non-inverting gate or buffer in the following circuit. In this case, the output signal takes the following form. All the information for this video was taken from The Art of Electronics by Horowitz and Hill and the book Popular Digital ICs by Shiloh. Now you know what contact bounce is and how it can be addressed using hardware methods. Solving contact bounce issues will save you from multiple floating errors when developing your devices. Friends, I hope the video was helpful to you. If so, don't forget to support me with a like and all useful links will be, as always, in the video description. Thank you for your attention. This was Andre with you. Goodbye.